Oki Gitchenaximatsimochboa. What follows is my lecture for the Phenological Lunar Cycle Pakipists Otsit HP. This is part of a year-long three-course Blackfoot Phenology course series that I put together originally for the Ghana Studies Department at Red Crow College on the Blood Reserve. As you can see by the dating on the stick calendar in the image, I originally was giving these presentations around 2011, so it's been over a decade. I haven't visited these slides in a while, but it was noted that on my um, playlist of phenological course lectures, uh, this was one of the missing lectures, so I wanted to get it in there. Um, so, obviously, the name of this moon is derived from uh, the event of the choke cherries, Bakipists, becoming ripe. And this is a berry that's a traditional food in Blackfoot, an important traditional food, uh, second only to Saskatoon, uh, but it's prepared in a different way. Okay? These berries are, are fairly easy, gathered in large numbers, and then uh, how you prepare them is you crush them. Okay? You take a, a stone or a hammer and, uh, and you crush them into a, into a mash, pits and all. And that mash, um, Paxinikimon, I think it's called, you, uh, you just eat it like with your fingers. You grab a piece of the mash and uh, roll it around on your tongue and in your mouth and swallow it. Don't chew it because the little pieces of those uh, seeds of the Buckkeep will, of course, damage your teeth and that kind of thing. But they're supposed to be good for your innards, hey? They're part of cleaning yourself out. We used to have a lot more grit in our diet, a lot more dirt, uh, little bits of stone, um, pits and bone and these kind of things. We're lacking a lot of that. So adding um, uh, crushed choke cherries to your diet would be a would be a good thing and not only for that but also because of the cyanic acid that's um, present in the choke cherries all cherry trees all of those I guess they're prunus uh, genus I'm not sure but um, all cherry trees basically have a high level of cyanic acid cyanide um, in the leaves in the bark in the um, pits of the fruit and so typically you don't eat cherry pits um, you know for that reason not that it's gonna you know do you a lot of damage if you if you were to but like you know uh, you wouldn't want to eat a lot of cyanic acid from this plant you wouldn't want to munch on leaves and that kind of thing but I guess having a little bit of that cyanic acid uh, in, the, in the pits and then mashing the pits as we do in the Blackfoot style of, of preparing this food um, and consuming that little that trace cyanic acid, uh, I guess it's supposed to be good for helping to uh, decrease the likelihood of of um, cancers and tumors and things erupting like cells that are um, dividing in weird ways and stuff and so it was explained to me <laughs> by a, by a non-scientist as a low-level kind of uh, chemotherapy potentially so both of these things are are good and they have to do with keeping that pit in the food and uh, not chewing it just swallowing it hey Bakipist. So this uh, fruit becomes ripe and because it's such an important plant in the diet, of course, the, the whole lunar cycle gets named after it. Although lots of things is going on in this lunar cycle, also important traditional things. For instance, Nawakotsis, the original tobacco, um, would be 
would be completed by now. It, its growth would be completed. It would be harvest time in in this lunar cycle in the in the past. Now, um, in Siksika near Calgary at present, and I'm talking from 2022, uh, right now recording this lecture, um, there is a movement to try to renew the tobacco planting ceremony, but really uh, it's not there yet, and it has been the ceremony absent since the 1950s. Uh, but there is a, a large complex around both the planting, especially the planting, but also the harvesting. Um, there's a, there's a, my understanding is there's a, a, a four-day movement toward the harvest camp. Um, uh, you know, with you have to, you have to uh, camp every night closer, closer, closer for four days, and there's certain things that you do as you approach the plants. Um, there's really good records of the tobacco planting, if you want to read in detail about them, uh, at the Glenbow archives uh, in the Hanks files. Um, but in any case, I've, I've said in earlier lectures during the time of the uh, planting of the seeds, I talked about, I think, the origins of the tobacco. And um, so this one you're looking at here is the larger of the two plants uh, that are, that are Blackfoot traditional tobacco plants. And this is the one that was originally given in dreams to one of the, the brothers, the four brothers who were involved with one of the early beaver bundles. Um, when they were stingy and, and withheld, uh, the use of this plant from the people in general, the, the, the community kind of turned around and sent someone who was good at uh, acquiring spiritual gifts um, out to fast and um, and see if if uh, spirits would give him the plant as well. And he did come back with one, and it's this plant. Now, this is the smaller of the two plants, but this one came directly from the sun. And there's a story um, that's related to a lot of Blackfoot art about the the birds that were sent up to try to get the seeds for this plant. The crow original or finally came back with the seeds. Um, and it's part of the explanation for why the crow uh, and raven is black. Hey, because uh, they're able to go to the sun. They're able to, uh, to, to be that conduit for us. Um, a lot of people would be perhaps surprised to learn that the crows and ravens are actually the, the traditional uh, kind of most powerful um, spiritually uh, traditional bird in the in the Blackfoot system. Uh, maybe after that, after them, the loon, um, the eagle is not not on the list for a while. <laughs> uh, the eagle gave like one song uh, com compared to the. Uh, the crows that have given many, at least at least into the orthodox system. So this is the plant that comes from the sun. Um, I still grow this plant. And yeah, this is the time of year for the harvest ceremony to occur. In terms of other kind of traditional foods and such, gardeners yampa, they call this, um, the wild carrot that grows on the prairies here. Uh, in Blackfoot is called Nisikapas, which refers to the root having two, sometimes two, sometimes three, you know, um, nutlets. I would call them, even though they're 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 roots. Say hey? they're uh, what they're carrots, and they have that carroty taste. But um, I would say these ones here that grow here have a a a, a bit of almost a. I don't know, it reminds me of kind of a hazelnut quality to them, hey, even though they're a carrot, and they're just delicious. Uh, unfortunately, they're also prone to over-harvesting. Like, if you, if you take these out uh, and, you, and you clear harvest, you're not going to have yampa there the next year. Hey, they don't, um, the patches don't grow that efficiently. Um, I've wondered about you know, in terms of uh, agriculture, 
putting some of this out there. It could be the next macadamia nut, really. They dry very well, too. You don't, you don't have to keep them refrigerated or canned or anything or frozen. Um, you can dry these and eat them dried, and they taste good. Gardner's Yampa. I find them mostly um, in the foothills and, and uh, up into the mountains. These tikapas. Another root that you could harvest this time of year. Well, most times of year you can harvest this root. But this is the uh, wild licorice. Ah, so. And uh, I think the ah, so refers to the... Well, I know it refers to the burr of the plant rather than the root. I think the name for this root was in the past Otachkoas. Otachkoas. Uh, the, the yellow root. And the reason I think this is because there are uh, some records, uh, Claude Schaefer's files from the, from the National Museum of the Plains Indian in Browning, when he was he was the second curator of the museum in here in the 1940s and the 50s and uh, the elders that he talked with when they talked about this root and they talked about it as kind of like almost like a power aid type of a root for the buffalo runners they would chew on this uh, for a kind of a supplement of energy okay? and it's very sugary uh, if you go to Waterton Park and you go to the, their famous candy store there, you'll find sticks of this root right up on the counter for sale at a buck a pop, about the size that you see uh, uh, Mahoney holding here. And um, yeah, they're kind of a sugary, it's almost like sugar cane. It's, it would be like our local sugar cane. Um, it doesn't have this, the strong quality of licorice that... that um, there's another plant here uh, that's uh, Mountain Sweet Sicily that has a much stronger kind of licorice and is also used in traditional medicines and such. Um, but this one was the Buffalo Runners. And a lot of mice like the, uh, when we get into winter, you'll see a lot of mice enjoy, and, my, and small rodents enjoy the seeds and that kind of thing. Other related Plants to the Yampa that we talked about, to the Nistikapas, uh, up further in the mountains is Omachkas. Uh, this is the fern leaf desert parsley, and a very, very important plant in Blackfoot traditions. Uh, is this is the root that was given to Soatsaki, Tail Feathers Woman, the woman who married a star, um, perhaps Morning Star. She lived in the lodge of the sun and the moon um, with her husband, and they had a child. And she was being taught by the moon, um, you know, women's roles and such. And she was being taught uh, root digging. She was given the first root digging stick. And the one root she was told not to pull was this one, Omachkaz. Um which made her curious. Why, why couldn't she harvest this? And so one day when she was there harvesting without the moon, she went ahead and dug one up. Well, she tried to anyway. She tried to dig one up and her, and her digging stick got caught uh, in the root and she couldn't pull it out and had to get cranes to come there and uh, take it out for her. And if you know the story of Bawakski Scarface, you'll know that cranes in that world are not necessarily the um, looked highly upon by the sun and the moon. But in any case, the cranes help her dig that root up. And when she when it's dug up, it creates a hole from the sky world down to the earth. And she can see her old camp and her family, her parents and she starts to get homesick, and when by the time she's returned to the lodge for the night, uh, it's obvious that she's homesick. The moon surmises what has happened, and she tells the boy, you know, she's never going to be happy here now. Uh, you have to send her home. So they send her home with the digging stick, with her child, 
with this root or machkas to use as a as a, the s- strongest smudge, and um, <laughs> with some instructions to add to the already existing Ogan ceremony at that time, and so she came home with all of these and uh, told the her camp what had occurred and she wasn't believed in general like uh, people were like yeah right Um, you married a star you weren't just um, you know you didn't just take off with some guy from another tribe or something and he knocked you up and then threw you out right that's not what happened you married a star and you come back and uh, the moon gave you this stuff and you're gonna be the one that sits our most sacred ceremony yeah uh uh-huh Nobody believed her except the Iochimics, the beaver people. And the beaver people, uh, um, to show that they were recognizing her story, validating her story, they transferred her the elk headdress um, from the elk origin portion of the Okan. And after, thereafter, the elk headdress was known as the Natoas, the sacred root from this story. And in, in, re, you know, in exchange, uh, in payment for the transfer, um, Soatsaki gave the beaver bundles omachkas, omachkas, and uh, as the winter smudge. And this is the smudge that's used on the Natoas too. So... Um, and it's a, you know, it's connected with the Okan, um, that baby that she brought back with her, um, in some versions of the story, that baby is Scarface. And when they come down on the Spider-Man's web from the sky, from the hole in the sky, uh, he gets kind of a rope burn on his face that, that turns him into Bawakski, who is a very important Blackfoot. Uh, figure in the in the origins of the sacred traditions so um and in and in some most versions of that story she's when she comes down she's told not to let that boy touch the ground because for a period of of time um because if he touches the ground he'll feel heavy and he'll get homesick and he'll return to the sky and sure enough one day she goes to pick berries and leaves the boy with her mother, the infant with her mother, and her mother thinks that she's cruel for not letting the boy crawl around, so her mother puts the boy on the the ground, and immediately the boy starts crying, like terrified, crying, pain and pain, and so the mother picks him up and consoles him, gets him to quiet down, and then lays him in his hammock again, nestles him up with blank, you know, his robes and stuff, as if nothing happened, when Soatsaki comes home and she pulls the robes back, there's nothing but the kakatotsi, like a puffball mushroom, because he's turned back into a star. So that's part of that tradition around this plant. This is the root itself. This is you have to have the the crane song from that story to dig this root, um, which I happen to have. It's part of the beaver bundle tradition now, as I've explained. So often people confuse this root, Omachkas, um, with this root, Bonokaki. This is the balsam root. And it's a bigger root, actually. So you'd think big root, Omachkas, that would be what this one is called. And in some ethnobotanies, Blackfoot ethnobotany reports, people... Um, misidentify this as Omachkas and is related to that Soatsaki tail feathers woman story. It's not the plant. What this is was a, a food plant, a very important food plant, all over the Great Basin and into the plains um, where they're coming down off the mountains. And uh, you pick this plant. This is another plant where once the flower the flower stalk comes up, the root is, is far too woody. And it's woody to begin with. It's a, when you harvest this, it's a, it's a big um, uh, root 
and it's got like a almost a bark, a strong spruce like bark cover on it uh, that you have to take off. And it's and it's there's a lot of sap and it's that balsamy sap. Um, you have to take that bark off and then you have to roast this whole thing. And then after it's been well roasted, you basically have to you have to scrape the the good stuff, the mash. Again, back to this word. I've never used the word mash so many times as in this lecture. You scrape that that mash away from the fiber and eat that. And it's sweet tasting. I've 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 done it. These are some of my students from when I was teaching at Red Crow, uh, out harvesting in the mountains with me. And uh, yeah, it's a good tasting, but it's it has been many times misidentified as uh, omachkas, and this is not. This is bonokaki, which means the elk woman, and it's related to the other story. Um, here, you see a couple of students harvesting. I don't think I show the berry itself but this is uh, uh salmon berries it's almost it's like a wild raspberry grows in the in the mountains here salmon berries and they grow on the pacific coast too much beloved by uh myself and uh, these guys <laughs> anytime you're up in the mountains harvesting berries which is you know this is the time to be doing that um you're contending you have to know that you're contending with the with the bears um and so you know they're very very rarely uh any like on you know record since colonization there's never been any blackfoot people attacked by the by bears uh while picking berries um there have been blackfoot people attacked by bears in 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 blackfoot history of course uh, there's, there's good records of that in some of the traditional stories, but, you know, on the, on the average here in Alberta, you know, we get bear attacks. Um, I don't know about every year, but, but fairly frequently. And, um, and a lot of it's at this time of year, the harvest season and there, you, you're just contending for food and you're getting in the way of, uh, mamas with cubs and it's just a bad scene so if you go in the mountains you have to be particularly careful in this part of the harvest season that's part of akakios and or being being aware being wisely aware um, know that you're in competition when you're in the mountains this time of year with these guys who are trying to fill up for the coming winter oxpi another important plant to learn if you're in the area uh, this is cough medicine, oxpi. Oxpi literally talks about it being sticky, and so does the English version, gumweed. And indeed, the plant is very sticky, especially those little spiny flower, you know, pods there that you can see the flowers coming out of, and those little, they got those little dangly hairs coming, all that, it's all like, it's got this resin on it. Good stuff for fighting coughs um, and other things. I've seen this plant mixed in lots of other traditional medicines, but uh, it, your basic, you know, Blackfoot first aid cabinet kit or whatever, if you need a cough medicine, this is my go-to. Hairy golden aster, one of the last flowers of summer. And this is what we start, this is what we see in this lunar cycle is the, the flowering of the last the last asters, the last flowers of summer, hairy golden aster being one of them, um, tufted white prairie aster being another, and of course, you know, it's worth paying attention to who's all visiting these flowers and who's related to what plants, even if we don't have a, a traditional use of food or medicine use um, for them. Part of the ecosystem, no doubt, depends on them. Kinni, uh, the prickly rose. And we actually got three species of rose. So kinni is the word that's used for all three and may even include hawthorn. 
I'm not sure about that, but it's likely. Um, our, our most common around here is the prairie rose, and which is like very low to the ground, and the prickly rose, where there's more moisture. Uh, and then there's also the Canada rose. So anyway, uh, all of them have these hips, these berries that they grow. And the hips at the right time are delicious. And this is not the right time. This is not the right time. They are not sweetened yet. Uh, wait for the first frosts to come. And when you can pluck the berry and just squeeze it between two fingers and the little seed pod shoots out and it leaves you with all the flesh in your fingers, then you know they're ripe and ready to eat because you don't want to eat those seeds. We'll get to that when we get to winter. <laughs> okay, moving away from plants now. Start getting into the waterfowl. So here you see coots and uh, mallard, um, lot of what I see on the pond this time of year are groups of mallards that were born this year. Uh, they all have kind of female plumage, even though some of them are male. Uh, these are these are kind of the the new the new the new uh, broods of the year. So they're still hanging around the pond. Um, not so for the geese. The on the river, the common merganser me sa eh. Um, Again, you'll see these broods of this year's um, mergansers. And again, the, the plumage is all looks very female on all of them. They haven't kind of, males haven't developed their distinct plumage, which is kind of neat. It reminds me of people because, you know, because before a certain, um, you know, before a certain age, before the puberty, uh, boys and girls, really, they might as well just be a neutral gender. Um, and in some cultures, and in very ancient past Blackfoot culture, that's, you know, and even even modern, that's kind of the way it is, you know. Book X is the category that covers both of them. They're not really Akikwan, like a girl, um, until uh, that a little bit later, until they're more pub pubescent get in there any case um the geese at my pond during during um this lunar cycle usually the geese are gone they've flight trained they've left they've grouped up with other geese they're hanging out on the stubble fields they're going to the lakes with the larger groups already um during the day we did have on one occasion and i, I believe it's this very family um during the flight training, there was one of the three uh, goslings. In this photo, you see two parents and three goslings. I couldn't tell you which was which at this point. Uh, maybe if I looked really close. But in any case, one of the goslings couldn't learn to fly. He wasn't getting it. And the family had trained and they knew how to fly and they were, way, they were you know, wanting to get going. And eventually they just left. They just left and they left the one gosling there that couldn't fly. And he was l alone at the pond for a couple of weeks. Um, and then he learned how to fly and he took off. And then uh, a few days after he took off, I witnessed something where two geese came back to the pond. One of them positioned itself on the beaver lodge and just called out the whole time, wah, 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 you know, like calling out, calling out, looking, looking, looking. The other one started at the very far north end of the pond and, and paddled all the way down to the south end of the pond. Um, and, then the, and then these two, uh, they left. They were looking for their, their child, their brother, uh, one of the two. It's either has to be the siblings or it has to be the parents or maybe it's a parent and a sibling. I don't know. But it was an organized search that they carried out and they didn't, they didn't find their other gosling. Um, I don't have a photo for it, but uh, the, the, a lot of times during this lunar cycle, I'll see um, 
fledgling hawks. And the fledgling hawks, they look just almost like adults, uh, except they allow you close, like, <laughs> like as close as a robin will allow you. You know, they don't understand to be afraid of people, I guess. And so, and they'll often be sitting on the ground, um, eating, feeding. And what are they feeding on? Why, two striped grasshoppers, of course, and other grasshoppers. It is Grig season. And uh, Griggs are all the grasshoppers and all those kind of, you know, crickets, all the shaped, all the, all the insects shaped like these guys, Griggs. So, um, yeah, the young hawks are just eating these, eating these. And in fact, as the harvest season gets rolling here on the blood reserve, um, you'll see Swanson hawk groups get together. Sometimes there'll be a hundred hawks. Uh, following after the combines and eating the grasshoppers that are exposed and, and chopped up and all of that stuff, just feeding. And those Swanson hawks will then eventually migrate as larger and larger groups going further and further south and the whole way uh, feeding off grasshoppers all the way to Costa Rica. That's, a, that's basically what they eat the whole, you know, what for us is the winter season is they eat the, the grasshoppers. Um, and bigger and bigger flock, the bigger and bigger, you know, yeah, flocks and such. And then, and then when they come back up this way, they start feeding on, um, you know, there's no grigs, there's no grasshoppers as they start coming up here. And so they're more reliant on rodents and stuff again. Uh, so they, so they start eating small rodents and stuff, but is the timing of the, of the, uh, fledgling hawks coming out of their nests is very coincident with the arrival of the Griggs in large numbers. Okay. Um, I wondered whether also because, you know, I don't know if I have a slide featuring it, it doesn't seem so, probably in the next lunar cycle, but also another animal that uh, I've wondered about having a connection with the Griggs are the rattlesnakes because the young are born this time of year and I wondered whether uh well into the next moon really the young are born and I and I wondered whether they eat anything before they go you know they can't they can't go into their hibernation or their brumation with anything in their guts but they've got enough time between being born and going into that phase that they could conceivably have a first meal and pass it through their system and what would be available and of size for them I figure would be a grig but I've tested this on a uh, on a neonate on a newborn rattlesnake that I came into custody of for a short period and uh, at least in the case of the little guy I was taking care of he did not take advantage of the situation to eat the grig. Of course, the grig may remain largely out of reach of the little guy. Most of the time it was in the tank. It, it tended to like hang on to the top and it might have just died of starvation or whatever, but the rattlesnake didn't have any interest in it in any case that I could see. This is a tree cricket. We got lots of different crickets here. You might run into one of these guys and wonder, what the heck is this alien looking thing this is a tree cricket um even more freakish looking the spurge hawk moth larva <laughs> these guys eat the leaves of leafy spurge the dreaded hated noxious weed neat leafy spurge that is actually an indigenous plant to this region and made its way where it has made its way by its own you know like a normal plant means, hey, where, where Spurge is living, it's living because it's supposed to be living there. But, uh, but yeah, it's poisonous to a lot of livestock. And so um, agriculture doesn't like this plant. And so they've been looking long and hard. And still today, still today, you know, some of the most re recent in Lethbridge, the last several years has been... Uh, hiring herds of goats in the summer to go into the areas of the coulee with the most spurge and have the goats eat the spurge because the goats can handle it. 
Um, but somewhere in the 1980s, I believe it was, their most recent solution was, hey, let's bring in this insect called the spurge hawk moth because its larva eats the spurge. And so they introduced this this uh, insect and uh, now, you know, you can find this insect still like uh, 40 years later <laughs> in the coolies and uh, it's not taking care of the so-called problem but it's added another animal into our ecosystem basically I got no issues with new additions if they're so long as they're fitting and this guy seems to fit doesn't take too much advantage of the uh, plant that he was supposed to be dependent on <laughs> um, it's a good kind of parasite I don't know the jewel or cat spiders you'll start seeing um, if you haven't already these are big pregnant mama garden spiders and such um, and they've become very synanthropic they uh, typically m make their their nests which are um, orb nests or is that what they call orb nests those typical like spider-man type of nest the big round nest um, I think they're called orb weaving uh, spiders that make those kind of nests. But in any case, they typically make their nests near electric lights now because of the how it attracts the the insects. So they're one of the species that people indicate as a as a strong synanthrope, as one that's come to live a lot closer with humans. And Believe it or not, we're to our last slide. There's a lot more to say about this lunar cycle. I'm going to have to beef up this uh, this presentation at some point. But you will notice, if you're looking around, that uh, there's also already little patches of leaves turning among the poplar. Now, this is, this is due to probably an aphid issue on that branch. But it is, uh, to me... It is kind of a harbinger of, um, uh, you know, an indicator of the turn to come because as we come into the next lunar cycle, we're going to see these green leaves go gold like this all over the place. In any case, I hope you have enjoyed. This are the, some of the things that I typically see in this lunar cycle. As I say, there are more things to it, but I've uh, given, I think, several of the Blackfoot really traditional um, phenological events that are occurring in this lunar cycle, uh, stuff to incorporate into your living if you were in a Blackfoot territory. Again. Okay.